Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, this webinar is presented by the Spanish speaking acousticians in the Americas. Uh, we are a chapter of the ASA and we'll have this presentation in English, but uh, I'm going to do an introduction in Spanish next. Um, and uh, for those listening in Spanish, there will be simultaneous uh, interpretation. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, este evento eh, está programado en inglés, pero vamos a tener interpretación simultánea. Eh, para los que no nos han acompañado antes, eh, eh, ya les vamos a mostrar cómo conectarse a la interpretación. Eh, tenemos una sección de eh, Q&A para hacer las preguntas que se van a responder al final de la charla. Y también pueden usar el chat si quieren hacer comentarios, eh, saludos, de pronto preguntas más cortas que, eh, que la presentadora puede incluso responder durante la charla. El capítulo en este momento no tiene ni, ningún costo de, de membresía, entonces para unirse al capítulo eh, pueden eh, simplemente eh, registrarse. No hay que ser miembro de la ASA para ser miembro del capítulo. Sin embargo, eh, pues los obviamente animamos a que se hagan miembros de la ASA también. Tiene muchas ventajas. Para los países en vía de desarrollo hay una categoría especial muy económica, igual que para los estudiantes. Eh, la junta directiva actual eh, somos eh, estos miembros que están aquí. Pronto vamos a tener una asamblea general de miembros y elecciones eh, el 7 de junio, creo que la definimos. Estén atentos, eh, queremos invitar más gente a que se una a nuestro comité y también eh, a que asistan a la asamblea para, para que escuchen las actividades que hemos hecho en el último año. Estamos en muchas de las redes sociales, entonces eh, especialmente eh, los animo a que vean el canal de YouTube porque allí tenemos grabaciones de todas las charlas anteriores, eh, tanto en el idioma original cuando han sido en inglés como en su interpretación al español. Eh, como les decía, vamos a tener eh, interpretación simultánea. Eh, el botón de Zoom de interpretación, que es el, el mundito que ven ahí, eh, ahí se pueden conectar al canal de la interpretación. Y el, el botón de preguntas y respuestas está al lado. Eh, ahora voy a pasar inglés, entonces, a hacer la, la eh, presentación de, de nuestra presentadora del día de hoy. So we welcome everyone. Uh, we are here with Dr. Laura Klepper. Uh, we're going to be talking about echolocation in bats and odontocytes. Uh, this is, by the way, a word that is new for a lot of us. Uh, so we'll learn what all of those new words mean. Um, Laura uh, is a professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of New Hampshire. And um, I've known her for a few years uh, through ASA, uh, but I didn't know anything about her work until last year when uh, we were both instructors for the ASA school. It was very interesting to see something completely different to what I do in my real life. I'm in architectural acoustics, and hopefully uh, we'll have maybe some people who are actually in animal bioacoustics, but if you're not, you're going to be as fascinated as I was with this um, topic. So I think uh, anything that relates to animals um, is interesting for us, but especially echolocation and how animals use sound for different things and how they produce those sounds is going to be very interesting. So um, help me welcoming uh, Dr. Laura Klepper, and uh, I'm going to give her the screen now. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. And we hopefully will be in business. Um, hi, everyone. It's so nice to uh, be here today and to uh, be able to talk with you. And as Anna did mention, um, we have known each other for several years through the Acoustical Society of America, uh, primarily with the Women in Acoustics uh, Committee. But we had a wonderful opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better uh, with the ASA School. And if you're not familiar with the ASA School, um, you should either talk with myself or with Anna or look it up online. It's, a, it's really a wonderful program. Um, and if you are eligible, I strongly encourage you to apply to the ASA School. 
Uh, but today I am going to be giving an introduction into the overview of echolocation in bats and dolphins, and not just dolphins, but toothed whales, a group of dolphins and toothed whales we call odontocetes, which are basically the whales and dolphins that echolocate. There are other whale species that don't use echolocation. Um, and so uh, my work is inherently involved with, with echolocation. Um, and I actually, um, well, let me hop into my career path. So I got my bachelor's degree from Boston University, which is located here in the United States. Um, and then after I graduated, I worked on fishing boats, I worked on marine construction boats, and I was also a high school teacher for several years. And then I decided that I wanted to uh, continue pursuing science, but in an academic setting. So I obtained my PhD from the University of Hawaii, where I studied dolphin biosonar, which is another word we have for echolocation. Um, and I thought that I was going to be spend my life being an expert in dolphin echolocation, but um, during a chance summer internship, I realized that I also loved bats. So I pursued a postdoc at Brown University and the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, where I investigated bat biosonar and signal processing. And then I joke that I was bitten by the bat bug and I, I remained in the field of bats. I then was an assistant and then an associate professor at St. Mary's College. And then I chose to leave that position to now move to the University of New Hampshire. And I am um, at the University of New Hampshire. My lab is the Ecological Acoustics and Behavior Lab. And we primarily use acoustics as a tool for understanding animal behavior and animal populations um, for conservation around the world. And we're doing really fun things with technology. So um, an overview, because I have this background in bat echolocation and dolphin echolocation, um, I'm gonna be basically uh, explaining the similarities and the differences between these two animals. So an overview of what I'm gonna cover is I'm gonna give an introduction to echolocation so we all understand what echolocation is, do uh, give some comparisons between odontocete or dolphin. You'll hear me use those terms interchangeably, either odontocete or dolphin, I mean the same thing. Um, so comparison between dolphin and bat sonar, techniques in how we actually record animal echolocation, and then some echolocation ad adaptations and strategies that we find, uh, again, similarities and differences between bats and dolphins. But I have to take a moment because like many of us, our work comes from those that were our mentors in the past. And I need to um, highlight two really important people, not just to me in my career and in my mentorship, but also important to the, this field in general and to the Acoustical Society of America. So the first person is Whitlow, uh, also known as Wit Ow. If any of you are familiar with dolphin biosonar at all, he literally wrote the book called The Sonar of Dolphins. Um, and he received the highest award that ASA um, gives to its members, the gold award, as well as the sil silver award in animal bioacoustics. And unfortunately he passed away a few years ago, but his legacy continues with the incredible array of students that he's mentored over his lifetime. And then the final person is James, Jim Simmons, as he's known. He has the silver medal in animal bioacoustics. He really set the foundation for bat biosonar work. And he is still working um, at Brown University. So everything that I am going to be talking about today can be traced back to the work that both Wit and Jim did in their career. So let's begin with a brief overview to what echolocation is and kind of how it how it works on the level of the individual. So echolocation is a form of animal communication um, in that it is a little different than most forms of animal communication because uh, echolocation is considered auto communication, meaning that uh, the sender and the receiver are the same individual. So unlike the senses that we tend to be familiar with, the senses that we use, vision, hearing, touch, um, echolocation is considered an intermittent sensing strategy. So what that means is that we're, when an animal is echolocating, it has to make a sound in order to get any sort of sensory information back. And so the way that this process works is that an animal, in this case, let's use a bat as an example, makes a very loud sound that is ultrasonic. So it is above the human range of hearing. It is above 20 kilohertz. 
And this really loud ultrasonic sound goes out into the environment, bounces off an object, and then returns in the form of, oops, I lost my animation here, and returns in the form of an echo. And my animation did not, oh, there we go. Returns in the form of an echo to the individual. And so from this returning echo, the animal then takes that information and compares the echo to the signal that it made. So it compares an echo to an internalized template of its emitted signal. And it then uses that information to get the distance of an object, the direction of an object, and even the properties of that object. So the echo information, comparing it to what it made, gives the image or the picture of its environment. So one of the challenges with echolocation is that fundamentally, because these animals are limited to getting echoes back from sounds that they made, they're receiving information only in snapshots of time. And they're often facing a challenge of moving through their environment as they're doing this, getting these snapshots of information and moving through their environment. So if you were a bat, say at night and echolocating through a forest, this might be how you would perceive your environment. So I hope this uh, sort of animation simulation lets you have a better appreciation just for the challenge that a bat is, is experiencing as it's trying to perceive its environment when it's moving through its environment. And so with a lot of my work, this is what I'm studying is how these animals are changing their echolocation as they're moving through environments. But aside from the fact that bats are cool and dolphins are very cool, why do we even study echolocation to begin with? Well, we study echolocation for many different reasons, but the primary reason we study echolocation, echolocating animals, is for a source of bio-inspired technology. So what I mean by this is that we've been studying odontocy and bat sonar for decades in order to improve our own active sensing devices. So systems like mapping the ocean floor, um, assistive devices for the blind, self-navigating technology, all of these technological devices and techniques came from the knowledge we gained from bats and dolphins. This is why we studied these animals. So even though we have these technologies and we've been studying these animals for decades, we still cannot create devices that are as small as say a bat, and that have the echolocation capabilities that these animals can do. So we continue to try to study these animals in order to improve our own technological devices. So this presentation uh, is talking about bats and dolphins, but it is super important that I also highlight that we are learning that there are other animals that use echolocation. So, um, if you're deep in the field of echolocation research with animals, some people, the terminology is really important. So either echolocation or echo ranging. Echo ranging is, is a, a cruder or less refined form of echolocation. Um, but terminology aside, let's just assume that we're just going to say any animal that has the ability to do any sort of echolocation ability can echolocate. So Classically, it's associated with bats and dolphins, but we are finding that more and more species are using sound to navigate their environment. For example, nocturnal birds that live in cave environments, oil birds and cave swiftlets, they make sounds to navigate their environment. Shrews make ultrasonic signals to navigate their environment. And even, and this blows my mind, that just two years ago, we discovered a whole new group of mammals that have the ability to echolocate. So there's a lot of people that hypothesize that there's more animals than we think that have the ability to echolocate. And we're continuing to get evidence that more and more animals are using sound as different levels and degrees of navigating their environment. But Bats and dolphins definitely have the most sophisticated echolocation system. 
Okay, so bats and dolphins have the most sophisticated echolocation system, and they're also a great example of a biological concept we call convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is when you have two unrelated animals that over time evolve the same strategy due to challenges in their environment. So the challenge that bats and dolphins have is that they both navigate in environments in which light would be of very little use to them. It's a dark environment. So the characteristics of their echolocation systems are actually quite different despite showing remarkable similarities in their echolocation abilities. And we're gonna spend some time talking about this. So the first is that odontocetes generate sounds pneumatically. Uh, what this means is they use high pressure air to generate their sounds. And we're gonna talk a lot about this and the really wild anatomy that odontocetes have for generating their sounds. Um, and I think you're gonna like that when we get to that in just a second. Um, they generate their sounds pneumatically. The frequencies of their vocalization signals, their echolocation signals, are between about 12 kilohertz and 200 kilohertz, depending on the species. Their signals are short, very, very short. In fact, between 0 0.04 and 0 0.08 milliseconds in duration. Because they are so short, they tend to be very impulsive and broadband, as indicated by the spectrogram in the middle, we have this vertical kind of, looks like some vertical line. This is what a spectrogram looks like of an odontocete click. Um, and then there's about 74 species of odontocetes. So in comparison, bats that echolocate, they generate sounds in their larynx. They emit them either through their mouth, depending on the species, or through their nose. That's very cool. Uh, they have frequencies that are very similar to odontocetes. Their frequencies range between 12 and 200 kilohertz, again, depending on the species. But the echolocation signals of bats are much longer. They range between 0.5 and 25 milliseconds. And furthermore, bats have an ability that dolphins do not. They have the ability to vary their, their pulse structure over time. So they can vary the fine pulse structure depending on behavioral context. We'll go into more information on that. And then we're still discovering more and more and more echolocating bats. It's thought that there are at least 760, 760 species of echolocating bats. Um, so now let's listen to some examples of these calls. So um, first, I'm going to play an odontocete call. And so these odontocete calls typically sound like clicks. And they are often interspersed with whistles. So what you're going to hear is a call of a false killer whale, a pseudorca crassidens. You're going to hear those echolocation clicks interspersed with whistles. So it sounds almost like popping in the background. Those are the actual echolocation clicks of the whale. So bat echolocation calls are much longer and they tend to be very tonal, meaning they sound almost like a musical note, especially if you slow them down. So now we're going to listen to a recording of a Mexican free tail bat slowed down to 5% its original speed. So you can hear the differences between the two calls. Okay, so now now we're going to get into the really cool stuff. Uh, let's talk about how odontocetes make their sounds. Totally wild, totally foreign to anything that you would imagine that these animals make. And uh, when I presented this uh, material at the ASA school, we had a very fun demo with balloons that we did. Um, and unfortunately, my four-year-old took my balloon out of my backpack that I had packed for, for today's demo. Um, so we're just going to have to pretend, but let's pretend, use our imagination, let's pretend that I'm blowing up a big balloon, blow, blow, blow up, and then I don't tie that balloon, I just blow it up, and then I let it go. Imagine what would happen. Hopefully, you're imagining a balloon that's going to go all around the room making a big noise as it flies around the room, okay? This example of a balloon is a perfect example of how odontocetes are actually making their echolocation signals. Because if you think about what's happening with the balloon, I fill up the balloon, it fills up with high pressure air, that air is under pressure. When I release it, 
that air is passing, passing through the neck of the balloon or the mouth of the balloon where there's that flexible material and that noise that's happening is from the, the opening of the balloon rapidly opening and closing, making vibrations. Well, guess what? This is exactly how these animals make echolocation signals. So I'm gonna play a short video that kind of zooms onto the inside of an odontocete's forehead to talk about sound production, sound propagation, and sound reception in these animals. After the dolphin takes a breath at the surface, air returns from the lungs to a series of nasal air sacs located below the blowhole. Although it varies between dolphins, there are four main pairs of air sacs. The nasal sacs are used to manipulate air pressure inside the spiricular cavity and as acoustic mirrors, redirecting sound forward. The current hypothesis attributes primary sound production to the monkey lips dorsal bursa complex. Each bursa lies slightly below a ridge that protrudes into the spiricular cavity. These ridges are the monkey lips. Pressure from streams of air bubbles released up the spiricular cavity from the lungs through the complex cause the anterior and posterior monkey lips to slap together. It is believed that the posterior monkey lips slap the anterior monkey lips like a hammer striking an anvil. The clicking vibrations are transferred to the dorsal bursa and passed on to the melon. The melon is an organ made up of specialized lipids that facilitate acoustic propagation of sound transferred from the monkey lips dorsal bursa complex. The clicks are organized into a beam as it travels through the melon. Once the sound is emitted from the melon and into the environment, it bounces off an object and returns as a series of echoes to the dolphin's mandible. Like the melon, specialized fatty tissues within the jaw region serve as the primary route for picking up sound and transferring it to the middle and inner ears. Okay, so let's just take a moment to appreciate how wild this production is. I mean, you couldn't, if you were designing a new organism, just to think about how this came about evolutionarily. So, uh, odontocetes make high pressure air inside their forehead, inside a cavity. They pass that air across slits of tissue. That air passing across the tissue causes vibrations that then reflect off the back of the skull and are sent forward through this fatty structure that's called a melon. Uh, and these fats have really interesting acoustic properties that help direct the sound energy forward. And they act as an impedance matching device to match the sound to this, to match the, the sound waves to the seawater for really efficient acoustic transmission. That goes out through the front of the melon into the environment, bounces off an object, and then it doesn't even go to the ears. It comes through the jaw. The jaw bone has a really thin, transparent area where if you held it up to light, you can see the light through that's filled with fat. Inside the jaw bone is filled with fat, and it's a fat channel that goes all the way to the interior to the internal ear of the dolphin. This way, the production and reception paths are completely isolated from one another. And this is how these animals make sounds and hear sounds. It's absolutely insane. So let's now take a look at what this anatomy looks like. Again, if you were to, to cut into the forehead of an animal. So we have the skull of the whale here, or a dolphin. We have the, this cavity that, where the high pressure air builds up. The phonic lips, also called the monkey lips, dorsal bursa complex, are the slits of tissue. You can't really see it in this image here. And then the sound vibrations reflect off the skull and back forward through the melon, okay? Dolphins, that in and of itself, that is a very wacky way to produce sounds. But the sperm whales, let's take the sperm whales. They take it to the next level. Male sperm whales, their forehead can be one third the length of the body. 
the way sperm whales produce their sound is even more interesting. So sperm whales, their phonic lips are located in the front of their forehead. So the whale takes a breath, the air goes through the blowhole and then down into the lungs. Okay, the lungs are way off the side of the slide, we can't see it. When the sperm whale wants to make a vocalization, make an echolocation click, it takes air from the lungs and shunts it into a cavity where there's the phonic lips in the front of the forehead. It then pushes that high pressure air past those lips. Those vibrations then reflect to the back of the skull where there is a sac filled with air that helps reflect it uh, forward. And then it comes back forward through a secondary part of their melon that is called the junk, oops, called the junk, which I think has a very funny word, a funny term. But inside the junk is a series of lenses, lens-like structures of different fatty composition that, again, just helps to focus this sound even more to create an intense signal when it leaves the front of the forehead of the sperm whale. So pretty wild stuff. So now let's talk about the echolocation abilities. We just covered a very bizarre way that these animals make sounds, but what about their echolocation abilities? So because sound propagates so much more efficiently in water than it does in air, dolphins can detect targets much further away than bats can. Dolphins in general can detect targets about 100 meters away, bats on the other hand, five meters. Uh, dolphins and bats both, though, can discriminate, meaning tell the difference between objects on a sub-millimeter level. So this is very fine resolution information they're getting from their echolocation signals. And then they can both resolve target separation by just a few degrees. So if two targets are located near one another, they can tell the difference by just a few degrees. So again, classic example of convergent evolution. And if, uh, if this is interesting to you, I really suggest that you look up um, a 15 minute uh, episode that was on national public radio here in the US, um, a program called Science Friday, in which myself and another ASA member, a colleague of mine, Brian Brandstetter, we had a live on air debate about which organism had the better sonar system, bats or dolphins. I was on team bat, he was on team dolphin, and we had a really fun and lively and heated debate about which sonar system reigns supreme. So I just explained to you the echolocation abilities of these animals, but you might be wondering, how, how do we know this? How can we actually determine that an animal can detect a target 100 meters away and has this discrimination ability? Well, we do this really with controlled behavioral experiments. All of this information has come with controlled behavioral experiments. So we expose these animals to different experimental conditions, and then we evaluate their echolocation abilities. So under these controlled conditions, we're able to train the animals to say yes, Ask we ask them to say yes or no questions, and then we manipulate what they are saying yes or no to. So for example, is a target present, yes or no? Is this a specific target, yes or no? And then while they are doing this, we record the echolocation signals of these animals so we can also understand how their echolocation signals are changing with these different tasks that they're doing. And again, these controlled experiments really allow us to get this fine scale information on the abilities of an animal, animal, animal's biosonar system. But it's really important also that if we're trying to understand the complete characteristics of a sonar system, that we also study the echolocation behavior of animals in, in their natural environment. Um, so in general, the recording methods for the echolocation behavior of bats, uh, wild bats and wild adonisites can be broken into three categories using an array of microphones or hydrophones. And with this array, we can do um, time of arrival differences to do acoustic localization. We also have onboard units that we can put on the animals themselves. So these are multi-sensory tags that have microphones built in, GPS, accelerometers. Um, but then we also use mobile platforms. And this is a main focus of my lab. We use mobile platforms that are not on the animal of focus because the bats I study are actually too small to wear a tag. So instead, 
I have mobile platforms. I use drones in my work that have cameras and microphones. And more recently, um, we have a trained falcon that we uh, or a hawk that we put um, a camera and a microphone unit on, and she is able to take that sensor for us and fly right through the swarm of the bats to get acoustic recordings of bats inside of a dense swarm. So I study a lot of um, the adaptive behavior that bats, when they're in these really big swarms, how they're changing their echolocation and flight behavior. So I can show you an example video of what this looks like from the perspective of the hawk. And you're hearing, what you're hearing are the act, is the actual audio of the bats. This is slowed down to 10% its original speed. So that's my mobile recording platform and I have a lot of fun with my work. I love, I love, 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 love my field work. Um, so by studying animals in their natural environment, we can then really begin to figure out how these animals are interacting while they're moving through space. So for example, this, um, these are some data from a tagged beak, beaked whale um, beaked whales are very elusive creatures, meaning they usually spend most of their time under the surface of the ocean and come up just to breathe before they dive again for sometimes up to several hours. And so for many, many, many decades, we knew almost nothing about the behavior of beaked whales. But once we were able to start putting tags with acoustic recorders on the beaked whales, we can then understand exactly how they are using acoustics and how that links to behavior. So, um, for example, this graph on the left shows a dive profile of a foraging beaked whale. So the thin gray line shows the recreated dive profile from a depth sensor. The thicker gray line shows when the whale is actually vocally active, so making echolocation clicks. So from this, we can learn that these beaked whales aren't even beginning to echolocate until they're 500 meters below the surface of the ocean. Furthermore, you can, uh, they make a certain type of signal called a buzz, which had been hypothesized to be associated with a feeding event. These animals make a buzz when they uh, feed. And so I'm going to play now um, the example sounds of this. So first of all, the first sound should be the, what we call the regular echolocation clicks, which is just when the whale is just making general sounds looking for what might be out in its environment. So it sounds like someone knocking at a door, knock, 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 knock. But these buzzes that have been hypothesized to be from feeding events, this is what these sound like. And so you might have heard a little bit in that buzz, it also sounded like a rushing movement. So from this tagging information, and it's not indicated on the graph here, what the researchers found is that when these whales are making a buzz, there's also this rotation of the body of the whale. So these whales are making a buzz and rotating their body, again, suggesting that they're capturing an object. But we can also do one more thing with the data that you get from the whale, and that is that you can, you can recreate echograms. So the tag, the microphone, or the hydrophone on the tag can actually pick up echoes of prey that are coming back to the whale. And so this graph over here is an, is an echogram of the sounds, the echoes that are coming back to the whale. So we have the range on the x-axis in meters, time on the y. And basically what is happening here is that this is the echo of a prey item as it's getting closer and closer and closer to the whale. So as time progresses, an echo is getting closer and closer and closer. And then right at the point at which the prey item gets closest to the whale, that's where a buzz was determined on the tag. This over here is just a, a acoustic reflection. So by putting all this information together from these onboard units, we can really begin to get an understanding of what these animals are doing just by studying their sound. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. So now I'm going to talk about um, some of the adaptations that are unique to these animals. So I just talked about some of the uh, methods we use to investigate echolocation. So now let's talk about some of the adaptive strategies that we've learned um, 
from animals. And we're gonna begin by highlighting bats. So before I continue, it's really important that I emphasize that there are actually two categories of echolocating bats. And it's important to highlight these two categories because fundamentally, these bats do different things. The way that they adapt their echolocation is in different ways. So the two categories are the frequency modulated bats. We call them FM bats. These are bats that their echolocation calls change in frequency over time. And then the other group of bats are constant frequency bats, bats that tend to have a really consistent frequency range that they make with their vocalization. Okay, so two categories of bats. FM bats versus CF bats. So first of all, FM bats are really flexible in their call design. So from multiple studies of multiple species, we know that one of the key traits FM bats have is their ability to dynamically adapt their echolocation signals depending on the behavioral task. So for example, most echolocation tasks can fall into one of two categories. First, detection. Is anything there? So in detection tasks, the optimal pulse design is one that is emitted at low rates with loud amplitudes, long durations, and low frequencies with kind of a narrow range of frequency components at that low frequencies. But once a bat gets closer to an object, it then switches and makes an echolocation signal that is better associated or better suited for discrimination tasks, meaning what is there? Call the optimal pulse design for a discrimination task is one that has many frequency components and that's submitted at fast rates and shorter durations. Um, and so we find that many bat species, in fact, do this. They adapt their echolocation signals, the FM bats anyways, do this according to the behavioral task. And so another way that we find FM bats modifying their pulses is during different behavioral phases of foraging. So when bats, and so this graph right here represents um, five different FM bat species, species one, species two, three, four, and five, showing how their echolocation calls are changing as they're getting closer to an object. So um, when bats are searching, just is, is a prey item there, they tend to have longer durations in between their calls. And they don't often have as wide of a frequency component. This is the searching phase. But as bats begin to shift into getting closer to prey items, they shift into an approach phase in which those calls are produced at a much faster repetition rate. And you tend to have more broadband characteristics of the frequencies emitted in these calls. These broadband signals are really important for aiding in the discrimination features of targets and for fine scale angular location information. So if we were to take uh, one of these bat calls, one of these sequences up here and zoom in on the individual calls, you can see an example of a, a, an FM bat call made during uh, the search phase. And then as it's getting closer and closer to an object, you can see just how much those echolocation signals change. Okay, those are the adaptations of the FM bats. Now, the CF bats have a totally different way that they do this. And for a while, I used to explain this with graphs, um, but I found an amazing video on TikTok by a science communicator that summarizes this in such a beautiful manner. So I am going to play this individual's uh, TikTok video. I think it's a TikTok that explains how remarkable these CF bats actually are and what they do to adapt their echolocation signals. And it, the key here is that they can do Doppler compensation. Right now, this image might not make much sense to you, but it's my favorite science graph ever because it's what happens when you swing a bat. Oh, sorry. It's what happens when you put a bat in a swing. And in case you were concerned, no bats were harmed in the study. They were all released the same day. So, you're a mustache bat. First of all, congrats. Second, you're gonna have to use your echolocation to eat about 500 bugs in one night. That's just how it is. I don't make the rules here. The problem is the world is a noisy place, so you have a few tricks up your sleeve. One of them is to make a wide sweep of frequencies. <laughs> But the other strategy is to make a specific frequency that you are just really, really good at hearing. How good at hearing? As a mustache bat, your ear is physically shaped to be good at hearing that pitch. A mustache bat's inner ear is physically thicker in the exact part of the ear that resonates at that sweet spot frequency. 
This strategy is great because you only have to worry about one frequency, so it's a huge load off your brain. But there's a critical problem with this, and that's physics. Physics! Specifically, the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is what causes frequencies from a moving object to increase as they approach, and then decrease as they leave. It's why when you're driving next to a car, you might hear eee! But if that same car passes you, you might hear eee! Now, as a bat, your problem is, the faster you fly forward, the higher pitch your echoes are going to be when they come back to you. And if the pitch increases, it's going to get knocked right out of your sweet spot. Uh, uh, nice. Uh, what? Uh, uh, I can't hear anything. So this whole plan can't work. You're constantly moving at different speeds, so the pitch of your echo is constantly changing. And you can't change that sweet spot that's built into your ear. This whole thing is a wash. Unless... Unless you, as a mustache bat, change the pitch that you make based on your speed to exactly compensate for the Doppler effect. So that when your echo comes back to you, it's always right in that sweet spot. Nice! This is called Doppler shift compensation, and it's incredible! But, arguably the bigger question is, how did we figure out that bats were doing this? Scientists put bats in a little foam swing. And when they swung the bats forward, they made this beautiful diagram. Those little red dots are measurements of the bat's pitch, and that black curve is the Doppler shift from the movement of the swing. And the pitch changes exactly to match the movement of the swing, so when you add them up together, you get exactly that sweet spot pitch. This is just such a beautiful graph. But some of you might have noticed something about this graph. Why is the pitch not changing on the backward swing? Over here, the red dots are a perfect mirror of the Doppler curve, but over here, they're a flat line. And the answer is so beautifully simple. Bats don't fly backwards, so they don't know how to compensate for that. And that's why this is my favorite science graph. So I know that was really fast, and I hope you were able to capture all of that information. I'll just do a quick summary of this, in that the CF bats, they actually compensate for the Doppler shift in their echoes based on their flight speed and actively lower the emitted frequency of their vocalization to match the flight speed so that their echo is always at the same frequency range. Again, I've been studying this stuff for mm, a long time now. And every time I talk about it, I'm always reminded that just how unbelievable it is. The sound production of Adonta seats, the CF compensation and CF, or the Doppler compensation and CF bets, it's just amazing to me. Again, bio inspiration for these challenges we have with our own devices. So, both FM bats and CF bats also, I mean, I don't have time to go into the details of this, but they also have the ability to both to modify both the emitted and the received beam. So bats do this with accessory appendages. So there's bats that echolocate either through their mouth. There's also some bats that echolocate through their nose. We call these, we call these the nose leaf bats and images here at the bottom left of one of these bats. They modify the outgoing beam by changing the shape of their nose or their mouth when they're emitting calls. And they can also modify the incoming beam by shaping and twisting and twitching their pinna, which are their external ears that come in. So even in addition to just the characteristics of the vocaliza vocalizations I talked about, these bats have the ability to change the shape of their overall sonar beam. Again, pretty wild. So, Every time I talk about echolocation, I also get asked the question about, well, what about humans? Can humans echolocate? And the answer is that actually, yeah, there are some humans who have taught themselves the ability to echolocate. And so I'm gonna play a video for you now that highlights a teenager who lost their ability to see and have instead evolved an amazing ability, to, or not evolved, a developed, learned, an amazing ability to echolocate. Ben Underwood is blind. Both eyes were removed when he was three, leaving him with no vision at all. So how on earth does Ben do this? And this, and even this. 
I don't think I've ever come across somebody like Ben. I, I, you know, he was quite unique. Ben lost his eyes to cancer, but unbelievably, he's taught himself to see with sound. If he chooses to go out there and, and ride that bicycle, let him ride the bicycle. It's got to be very smart. Somewhere in there, it's a little genius going on. I don't consider myself blind. Ain't nothing wrong with me. Ben has no guide dog and never uses a white cane. He's not even using his hands. Instead, he sees with sound. He makes a sharp click which bounces back off nearby objects. Amazingly, Ben's ears pick up the echoes and he can precisely locate where things are. Ben is the only person in the world who sees using nothing but echolocation. Well, I've been able to tell where walls are and where things on the ground are. If I click down, then I can hear them easier. But if I'm walking, I'm just clicking over it, it's not going to get it. And I can tell where desks are in the classroom and stuff like that. I can hear the wall over there, the couch over there. I can hear the wall behind me. I can hear the wall over there and the TV and the computer. Yeah. Ben, I need a towel for drying because I don't have all my kitchen towels in here. All right, Mom, I'm going to go get it. Ben's echolocation is so good that at home, his mum, Aquanetta, Uncle Kerry, and brother Isaiah make no allowances for his blindness at all. When I was a little kid, I didn't really know he was blind. I just knew he was my brother. Did he make it? He's determined to do what he's going to do. And he refuses for somebody to label him as blind. You see this kid that has a whole different way of thinking. It's magic and it's real. I don't think I've ever seen anyone quite as remarkable as Ben, uh, nor have I seen anyone quite as remarkable as Ben's mom. And I think that's a lot of the secret to, to Ben's amazing talents. He knows that there's nothing impossible for him. You know, and it's not. So uh, if you were paying attention to the sound that Ben was making, it was a click. That click is really important because that click is impulsive. It is broadband and it is short in duration, which is very similar to a dolphin click, a dolphin or an odontocete echolocation click. So I challenge each of you to test your own echolocation abilities. Because here's the thing. We actually have the ability to do a very crude form of echolocation. And most likely, Ben just trained himself over time to be very good at it. So let me see if I have a prop nearby. What can I use? I don't have a prop. Um, yes, I have an envelope. I have a mailing envelope. Someone just mailed me a hard drive from Antarctica yesterday. So if I make it, and I make that when there is nothing and it looks, I'm pretend my eyes are closed. I make that sound when there's nothing in front of my face and I listen. It sounds very different than if I put something up next to my face and make that sound. And so you can actually test this out if you have someone you live with. You can do a fun game with them saying, you have to decide, do I have something in front of your face, yes or no? And then you can even get so good as you can learn how to echolocate down your own house with the lights off and learn how to echolocate down a hallway. So it is, we do have the ability to do this. And there's actually researchers that are trying to test human echolocation, the abilities of it, how we can train people to be better at echolocating or navigating with sound. So uh, that actually takes us to the end of the presentation. Um, so just a summary, some of what I highlighted today uh, are the uh, signals that these animals use for navigation and foraging. They both use ultrasonic signals. They have really similar echolocation abilities, um, despite producing sounds really wild. And I hope all of you will run to your colleagues and say, you will not believe how dolphins make echolocation sound. This is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And let me talk to you about a sperm whale. Um, we also know that by combining lab and field-based approaches, we can really understand the echolocation limits and the function of echolocation. We talked about the flexibility in call design. Bats have this really flexible call design shape. 
CF bats do this incredible Doppler shift compensation. And then also humans have the ability to echolocate. So that is the end of uh, all the information I planned on presenting with you. And I'm really looking forward to any questions that you may have about bats and dolphins. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I think now um, everyone who is listening is as fascinating as, as, as I was with, with this new topic for us. Um, so let me see if we have any questions. Um, well, just a comment from Zach that um, it was very, very uh, clear, concise, and fascinating. Um, yeah. Thank you, Zach. Okay, yeah, and Carlos says his specialty is also architectural acoustics, but he found it very interesting and very well explained, so really fascinating. Wonderful, thank you, Carlos. I wonder if there, for those of you that are architectural acousticians, if there's any potential overlap that you can think of between what you've learned today in your field of acoustics? Well, I personally think that, um, you know, we, we work towards accessibility in architectural acoustics. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, if there are ways for us to build spaces that facilitate uh, people like Ben or, you know, people with limited maybe visual or other senses uh, to be able to, uh, to navigate better. Um, so you can imagine that there could be some um, cross uh, there. I was also thinking, I'm also in the architectural acoustics world. Um, we use not location, but we, you know, listen to spaces. We clap our hands to mm -hmm. listen to spaces and hear back those echoes. I think it's amazing to use it as a navigation tool. Um, but I've certainly done the exercise of you know, hearing that clap in different environments in a bathroom and, and see how different that echo sounds. It's really great maybe overlap. Maybe you'll start, maybe you'll start using tongue clicks instead. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You you can maybe tell when someone is an architectural acoustician when we go into a space and start clapping. Uh, but yeah, now we're going to go and do. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting, and and the way sound travels uh, is something that, you know, we're we as human be, uh, beings are so visual, uh, but our ears are so powerful. I think we just need to tune better into what we can do. Absolutely. Yeah, and Carlos is agreeing in the chat that that he also knows that coughing or clapping uh, are good methods for us to, to listen to the reflections in a room. Uh, yeah, Zach says, I could think of applications for people like Ben. It's also a consideration to make sure background noise is not masking the content the listener is interested in. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, for someone like Ben, you know, he would be able to successfully use echolocation um, if he were in a really noisy environment. Yep. Have you experienced any of that in the in the ocean world, wherever you know there's boat noise or something that could mask the the clicking? Yes, absolutely. Masking, uh, auditory masking for echolocating animals is a huge concern. Um, What's really interesting, and I definitely didn't talk about it in my presentation because I was focused more on just the incredible animals and not my work, that um, what I do a lot of my focus on with acoustics is trying to understand how bats are able to echolocate when they're in big groups. So the way we know that echolocation works, if you remember from the beginning, is a bat takes this returning echo and compares it to an internalized template which means you need to know that an echo coming back is from a call you made. But when you're in these big groups, like the video I showed from the hawk, how are these bats doing this? Everything we know about science says that 
they should be masking the other bats. It should be a really big jamming problem and they shouldn't be able to identify their own echo and they shouldn't be able to echolocate successfully, yet they're doing it. So uh, part of my work is trying to unlock some of the adaptations they're doing with the shape of their sound being the characteristics of the FM signals, because I study an FM species, to understand how they're making these adaptations to really facilitate discriminating their echo against all of this background masking noise. Well, I, I'm not surprised about a bat hearing his own signal in a swarm because uh, you're a mom, you know that if your kid cries in the playground, you know that voice, even though it's a baby cry and it might sound like the other hundred. Um, so that is true. Do that, I'm sure bats can do it a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and actually, I mean, we joke about that, but we're actually some of the some of the pilot data we've been investigating is showing that um, it may be something like that. It may be that bats, FM bats are making really subtle adjust. Well, to us, very subtle adjustments in their signals that is almost like they have their own voice or an acoustic fingerprint, a way that makes their sound so different from another bat that it's just like hearing a voice of someone you're familiar with. Yeah. So there's a comment from Hector. Uh, he says he saw another blind guy doing the same thing and, and thank you for the presentation. Yeah, it was you're welcome, Hector. Uh, this uh, Siva says, uh, this was fantastic and love to see your passion for these two. Uh, thanks for the talk. I work with people with hearing loss and often measure how brain plasticity can compensate for sensory loss. I wonder if you know or work with animals with hearing problems and if they even exist. Do they compensate their echolocation with other sensory input? Seba, I'm so excited you asked that question. I get to now talk about the very first publication I had as a graduate student. I didn't even think about talking about this. This is great. Yes. So um, I was really fortunate when I was a graduate student that I was working with an animal in one of these controlled environments that had been studied for decades. And we knew because we'd been measuring the hearing abilities of this animal for 30 years, we knew that she had high frequency hearing loss, right? Many people lose high frequency hearing when they age. So I said to my advisor, well, when she was younger and had really good hearing, someone measured her discrimination abilities. And remember discrimination is just how well you can tell two objects apart. And I said, can we replicate, we have her abilities when she had good hearing, can we replicate her abilities when she has not good hearing and see how that affects her echolocation performance? And no surprise, we saw a drop in her ability to discriminate between objects. We also then compared her echolocation signals and we saw that she shifted the frequency of her vocalization signals over the years so that she wasn't putting effort into making energy and frequencies that she couldn't hear. She was lowering the frequency component of her echolocation signals to compensate. So not using other sensory input, but changing their own, the own way that they're echolocating in a way that they're maximizing the sensory potential from their echolocation. So yes, absolutely. Fantastic question. You're on mute, Anna. I'm muted, yes. <laughs> I think we have no more questions at this time. So um, thank you again so much. I think uh, we're probably going to spark more conversation when we post these to our social network. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll tag Laura so she can answer more of your questions uh, if you watch the video later on, on Facebook or, or on YouTube, okay? And thank Absolutely. you for joining us. Um, join the Spanish speaking acquisition chapter if you haven't, and you're a Spanish speaking member. Uh, otherwise, you're always welcome to our talks. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura. This was amazing. This was so fun. Thank you, guys.